Good, good uh, evening, everybody, for those uh, who join us from Asia. Good morning for those like uh, Professor Ikeda who are uh, at the extreme west in, uh, in the Americas. And good afternoon for our European guests. Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, event that the Center for Market Education uh, brings uh, to you together with uh, Provalindo Nusa from uh, Indonesia and uh, the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs from Malaysia. A good partnership that uh, allow us to bring here uh, a prestigious speaker, Professor Sam Fordikeda, Professor of Economics at the Purchase College of the State University of New York and Research Associate at New York University. Um, Professor Ikeda is on the board of directors of the Economic Freedom Institute, the journal Cosmos and Taxis, and the, the Center for um, the Living City. Uh, he is lectured globally and has published in Forbes and uh, the National Review Online. He has published uh, papers in uh, several uh, prestigious academic journals, but he has published also some uh, very interesting uh, book like uh, The Dynamic of the Mixed Economy uh, a few years ago, if I remember properly. But over the years, he has become an expert on uh, uh, urbanism and urban economics. Um, I myself uh, I work on uh, urban economics and real estate economics here in Malaysia, and I have been uh, influenced very much uh, by the work of Professor Ikeda and by the works that Professor Ikeda has recommended to me as well. Uh, so I'm very honored uh, to have him here with us in this part of the world. Welcome, thank you very much for joining us. pleasure to be here. Although I'm still in Brooklyn. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Well, okay, I think nice that- to be talking the, to you in Malaysia. The good, the good thing, if there is any of this pandemic, is that somehow um, um, webinars become uh, more an alternative compared to traditional seminars. And a lot of guests that we we have fought to bring uh, here uh, as our speakers have become available online, uh, basically without having to bear transportation costs, hotels, so for institutions like the one that uh, um, that I, I lead, the CME, uh, is actually been an advantage in terms of the outreach uh, that we, we can have. Um, so before I start, I just want to give some uh, technical indications uh, to our attendees. Uh, please do not write into the chat room because uh, as you can see, if you open the chat room, we are having a live translation into Bahasa Indonesia. Okay? As most of our, um, uh, of our attendees will be from Indonesia thanks to the great effort uh, made by Provalindo Nusa in bringing attendees for this event, we decided to have both the slides and the actual lecture translated into Basa Indonesia. So if you need to say something, rather than using the chat, using the, use the other room, the Q&A room. And uh, we will use the Q&A later to answer your questions. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable in making a question into, ba into English, feel free to do it so in Bahasa Indonesia. Then um, uh, Mr. Chandra will translate uh, uh, into Bahasa English for, uh, for Professor Ikeda and for myself. <laughs> Despite the Batik, yeah. my Bahasa Indonesia is still <laughs> <It's> very poor. <laughs> <laughs> but getting better. But getting better, yeah, improving. Um, so allow me to give another um, uh, indication. Um, the recording will be later on available on our social media, YouTube, our website, marketedu.org, and our Facebook page and Twitter. Um, if uh, you want to receive the material from the webinar, you look for our contacts on our website and drop us an email. By dropping us an email, you can receive, uh, in this special occasion, plenty of gifts. 
So there will be a certificate of attendance, certificate of participation for this webinar. And this I know is uh, peculiarly useful for, for people from academia. And we will make available um, a, a paper authored by Professor Ikeda uh, titled What is a City? And the Center for Market Education recently published. And we will also make available another paper um, authored by myself and Mr. Chandra on the project in Indonesia to move the uh, capital city. And finally, of course, you will have available the, the slides, which are both in English and Basa Indonesia. Uh, so, um, thank you very much. I hope that everything is clear. Uh, I leave the word and the floor to Mr. Chandra Rambey, CEO of uh, Provalindo Nusa and Vice President of the Real Estate Association of Indonesia for some introductory remarks. Mr. Chandra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Carmelo, for the time. Ladies and gentlemen, participants of this webinar, good evening to you in Southeast Asia and good afternoon to you in other parts of the world. And good morning to Professor Sanford Ikeda in New York, America. Dear participant, it's a great honor and pleasure for us that you have taken the time to join us in our webinar. Our topic for today is urban planning and spontaneous order, which will be discussed by Professor uh, Sanford Ikeda from uh, the Purchase College for, of the State University of New York, America. Professor Ikeda is an expert in urban economy and produced many works related to the urban economy in various journals and media in America. This webinar was organized by Profal Indonesia in Jakarta, Indonesia, in cooperation with the CME, Center for Market Education uh, in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, uh, under the leadership of my friend, Dr. Carmelo Ferlito, who is in fact also a research advisor in Provalindo Nusa. Uh, Provalindo Nusa is a consulting company that provides consulting, valuation, and advisory services. The company itself was established in 1986 in Jakarta, and, then, and since then, it has helped many clients to develop their business in various industrial sectors throughout Indonesia. In addition to the helping the company, Profalindo also cooperate with uh, many government institutions, especially in development of region, new cities or new residential area, tourism area, also industrial estate in Indonesia, of course. We hope this webinar will be able to get an idea how to plan a city in terms of economic aspect and how the city is firm. I hope we will get a valuable additional knowledge from Professor Ikeda in relation to urban planning from various aspects and factors that influence it. Uh, such as uh, economic aspect, as well as the development of the property industry therein. Indeed, Professor Ikeda, reflection on urban development and planning has been crucial for the research work that Provalindo has done on the proposal uh, to the move Indonesian new capital city. The result will be uh, published in very soon in a form of a paper. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we hope that you will enjoy this webinar from the beginning to the end. Once again, we extend our gratitude to all participants. 
and also especially to Professor Ikeda for joining us today. And equally to Dr. Carmelo, who has worked hard to ensure this event runs smoothly. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Enjoy this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Carmelo. Terima kasih banyak, Pak Chandra. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. You're welcome. <laughs> And uh, now a brief nice introduction. Nice cooperation, yeah. It's a brief introduction before we start, because um, I'm sure that uh, all the attendees are very much interested and want to hear the voice of Professor Ikeda. Uh, for those uh, uh, who, who join us in particular from uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, I just want to stress one initial fact. Um, Professor Ikeda will discuss about the ontological nature of a city. Uh, but even if uh, um, such a discussion may look very theoretical, Indeed, in our daily experience, it becomes very real and very important. In example, here in Malaysia, we have a capital city, which is called Putrajaya, which was created not long ago, out of nowhere. So it was a city that was totally uh, centrally planned and built where there was nothing else before. And although I actually like Putrajaya in terms of architecture, the wonderful boulevard is uh, very, very green. I like to go there and have a stroll. We have to be honest uh, with ourselves and recognize that Putrajaya, beyond the political activity and uh, the, the administrative function, is a dead city. If I go there uh, to have a stroll because I like to do so, indeed, there is no place where I can stop and sip a decent espresso or even espresso at all. Probably there is even no Starbucks, which is not a decent espresso, but as an espresso, uh, to, make, uh, to make an example. So um, the aesthetic beauty, the appealing beauty uh, that we can find in Putrajaya doesn't correspond to a vibrant uh, uh, inner life of the city, which is in that, uh, indeed just an administrative center. And this happened uh, despite Putrajaya is probably just around 20 kilometers away from the heart of uh, Kuala Lumpur, the, the, the actual capital of, uh, of Malaysia, and uh, around 20 kilometers from Petalinjaya, which is the other big center of, uh, of Malaysia. Um, and for the people who are following us from Indonesia, think what is going to happen to the new capital city, which is planned to be built thousands of kilometers away from the present capital on a different island and requiring probably a couple of hours by plane to be reached from the present capital city. Which are the risks? For, for this project. And we, me and Chandra have analyzed this in, in the paper. And the paper is indeed full of uh, insights from uh, Sanford Decade. I think you will see in the references quite a plenty of, uh, of entries with uh, Sanford Decade there. And um, uh, is inspired a lot by the work of uh, Jane Jacobs and uh, Professor Alain Berthaud. Uh, probably toward the end of this conversation, instead, we will go more into uh, how these theoretical considerations find a meaning in the realm of the discussion on uh, COVID-19. And if we look at the United States, we have seen how COVID-19 has not affected all cities equally. Um, somehow, density, uh, population, and uh, uh, income uh, factors have uh, uh, influenced the spread of the virus. And this is related to the way in which a city is configured. And I'm sure that Professor Riquet at the end can, can lead us towards some meaningful thought on this topic. So Professor Riquet, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. We are all ears for you. Uh, thank you so much, Carmelo. Uh, and I'd like to 
thank the CME and uh, Provolindo Musa for inviting me to this forum and everyone who is uh, logged on currently from all over the world. It's uh, quite flattering. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction um, from you both. Um, so let me get started. Uh, I have a, a PowerPoint presentation, of course, which uh, I will uh, put up in a moment. I just want to um, make sure I can uh, access this. There we are. The, uh, the paper that the CME is, is uh, republishing is a work that uh, was originally published in a journal called Cosmos and Taxis uh, with the title, A City Cannot Be a Work of Art. And that is the title of my talk today. The, the title comes from um, a chapter in the book of Jane Jacobs, uh, her most famous book, which was published in 1961, called uh, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And it has, uh, that book has inspired uh, planners, urbanists, architects uh, in the for the past over 50 years. Um, and this phrase, a city cannot be a work of art, I think very well expresses what I think is the essence of Jane Jacobs's criticism of mid 20th century urban planning and um, also captures uh, in, a, in a way the, the path forward she felt that urban planners should take. So let me um, begin here. If, let's see. Yep. This is an image of a small image of Jane Jacobs. Um, and I begin with this quote. There's a quality even meaner than outright ugliness or disorder. And this meaner quality is the dishonest mask of pretended order, achieved by ignoring or suppressing the real order that is struggling to exist and to be served. I think that's a, a profound phrase that also comes from her uh, book, Death and Life of Great American Cities. In other words, she's contrasting a pretended order with a real order underlying emergent order, we might say. And that is the theme that I take up here. The, the uh, a chapter from which I, I took the title, A City Cannot Be Work of Art, begins this way. This quotation comes from that chapter. She says, artists, whatever their medium, make selections from the abounding materials of life and organize these selections into works that are under the control of the artist. The essence of the process is disciplined, highly discriminatory selectivity from life. In relation to the inclusiveness and the literally endless intricacy of life, art is arbitrary, symbolic, and abstracted. And she continues. To approach a city, or even a city neighborhood, as if it were a larger architectural problem, capable of being given order by converting it into a disciplined work of art, is to make the mistake of attempting to substitute art for life. The results of such profound confusion between art and life are neither art nor life. They are taxidermy, artificial life. So my theme, uh, extrapolating from Jacobs's comments, is a contrast of, on the one hand, the scale of an architectural or urban project and its design, and I will define these terms like a good academic uh, mo in a moment, in contrast to a spontaneous order and emergent complexity. Again, I will define these uh, momentarily. So here's an image of um, a small plaza, uh, probably Italy, I'm not sure uh, what, where this is. And you notice um, the, the, the physical environment, the pathway, uh, the buildings that are 
uh, built along this pathway, which which notice it, it's not a straight line; it's it, it's curved in a um, particular way. Secondly, the the people that are occupying this this space um, are seemingly disorderly. That is to say, there's no obvious pattern uh, discernible here, except for the fact that uh, they seem to be at peace with each other. That is to say, they're not, they're not con conflicting. They're not running into each other. And they're interacting with the built environment. They are walking on the pathway. There are stores uh, that they're going into. So the order, the uh, underlying order, is one that you have to uh, look for uh, and observe uh, very carefully, but it's there. This pattern of peaceful cooperation that exists among the people and their relation to the um, built environment. Here's another uh, image. We call this a, a piazza, as uh, Carmelo, I'm sure, knows. This is uh, um, the very famous piazza in Siena, Italy, um, a, a beautiful place which I uh, had the opportunity to visit. So a uh, couple of things to notice here again. Notice the built environment. Uh, this, this piazza is sloped. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure what the story here is, but I think today, if you're going to build a, a plaza in a city, you, you wouldn't build it at a slope like this. Uh, but notice that even though it's a large area, the slope sort of contributes to the warmth and inclusiveness of, of the, of the uh, space. Notice that the people sitting on it are all facing the same way, right? It's like a, it's like a theater. Uh, some of you may know that every year, I don't know about this year, but th every year there's a horse race that takes place within this plaza. Um, not an ideal space, not obviously not constructed as a as a uh, as a as a racetrack for horses, but uh, that that's how it's used. It has multiple uses. The um, surrounding buildings uh, um, are, are uh, of, of different ages, built at different times. Although they, you know, to us they all look uh, old. Uh, they they have a, a different <clears throat> set of vintages. And then the, the uh, notice at the bottom, there are restaurants and shops that the people in the plaza are um, either eating at, they're going into and buying. So there's this interaction that's taking place. Uh, nobody's telling anyone what to do. There were opportunities here for doing countless things. So people can choose what to do. Uh, there are probably negative rules which say you shouldn't uh, uh, make too much noise, uh, violence and aggression is prohibited, and so forth. But they're probably uh, very limited in comparison to the number of things that people can do, uh, a subset of which is what they are doing. So there are people, if you notice, you know, in the foreground, uh, there are people doing all sorts of things here, uh, uh, making love, sitting together, talking, standing in groups, uh, gathering in places um, and you know planning their planning their day. So this is a, a piazza. Contrast that with this image, which is in um, Pyongyang, North Korea. Uh, striking, uh, very orderly image. Certainly, one's first impression of this image compared to that is one of a uh, much greater order. Uh, there are tens of thousands of people uh, that, that constitute this order, that, that, that create this pattern. Clearly, someone had an uh, image that he or she wanted to create using individuals. But in uh, this, this, this flag, the, the North Korean flag, uh, and the background, the marchers in the foreground. But the, the people who are being used in this fashion have their individuality completely stripped away from them. 
if you've ever been in a parade or a marching band or something like that, there are strict rules that you have to do. There are mandates, if you will. And what is not mandated is forbidden. So that, you know, if you take some random person, you know, right there, he or she has to be standing in a particular place and do a particular thing at a specific time. Otherwise, you're undermining the order. The order consists of each person not pursuing his or her own plan, but of conforming to the rules that tell him or her what to do. Uh, this is a parade. I'm using the, the uh, terms piazza and parade, uh, uh, which was a contrast I, I got from uh, the economist Richard Wagner from George Mason University. I think it's a very useful distinction to be made. Okay, piazza versus parade. We have spontaneous order and complexity versus design and scale. So those are the trade-offs. Let's look a little closer at these. Again, conscious design and scale versus spontaneity and complexity. Okay, like any good academic, I wanna define some terms. And from Jane Jacobs, I wanted to find a city. This is from her second um, uh, significant work, published in 1969, called The Economy of Cities. She defines a city, I think it's important to define our terms here. She defines a city as a settlement that generates its own economic growth from its own local economy. Those are very few words, but there's a lot packed in there. First of all, notice that the definition that she uses is an economic one. She defines a city as one that en encompasses trade and um, markets. And in, in this sense, uh, she's in the same line of thought as the um, famous economic historian Henri Perrin, who studied, uh, among other things, the emergent, the reemergence of cities after the Middle Ages in Europe, and uh, he defined a city as one in which a, a, a merchant class or middle class um, exists, which uh, virtually disappeared during the Middle Ages. Okay, so that's one thing. It's an economic de definition. Secondly, um, the emphasis here is on economic growth, uh, innovation, economic development. So not with efficiency. There's no uh, uh, implication that uh, a settlement is necessarily efficient, but rather um, one that encompasses economic growth. And <clears throat> you might ask, well, aren't those consistent with each other? And the answer is no, they're not really consistent with each other. And I'll explain why a little bit later. One uh, frequently hears the term spontaneous order, particularly in certain circles in economics. And I, it's really important to, to define what that means, uh, particularly how I use it. And I define it <clears throat> as a, a spontaneous order, as a stable set of relations among independent individuals that is sufficiently coherent to enable them to form and carry out individual plans with a reasonable expectation of success and that emerges unintentionally from those individual plans. So it's a stable set of relations that emerges unintentionally from indi individual plans. The, those individuals can use those stable set of relations to plan with the Reasonable, success, uh, reasonable expectation of success. This, this uh, definition is derived from um, the work of Friedrich Hayek. Okay, so an, an order is this set of relations among individuals that enables planning. What do we mean by spontaneous order in particular? Where, or, or more specifically here, what, where is the locus of spontaneity? Because after all, we can't deny that conscious planning takes place. So where does the spontaneity, uh, spontaneity 
uh, come from? Where, where does it reside? Spontaneity seems to exist at a level just beyond a particular set of designed elements. The spontaneity of an order then refers to the unplanned patterns that emerge over time outside the boundaries of design. Okay, so what does that mean? I've, I've given um, three schematics below that. First, we have, for example, an individual plan. Let's say, oh, I don't know, I want to go to the, uh, to the grocery store and get some bread. That's my plan. In order to do that, I need to go to the store and interact with the people who are selling the bread. Right? We buy and we sell. So uh, how that exchange goes is not something that I can uh, control. When I make my plan, I, I have a pretty good expectation that if I go across the street to the grocery store, uh, and well, I say across the street because I live in Brooklyn, and we have these things within easy walking distance, that if I go across the street <clears throat> for, for a loaf of bread, then I'll, I'll probably find it, right? The relationship exists to my knowledge, and if I go across the street, it'll, it'll be there, and I interact. You buy and sell bread. Now, this is going on uh, everywhere within an economy. And not only buying bread, but buying milk, buying and selling cars, buying and selling uh, labor services, capital, and so forth. So these interactions combine, collectively, constitute an order. And so whereas, OK, after a while, we have an interaction of buying and selling in one particular market, the um, amalgam of all of those relationships, what emerges from that is a social order which nobody has planned. So we might have planning at the individual level. Once those stable set of relations exists, we have we might be able to some, in some ways organize or institutionalize that. However, from that then emerges a social order. Let me skip down to the last, which is uh, relevance to our topic today. We have an individual uh, structure a building that is designed by an architect. That building, let's say it's a single building within a block, uh, interacts with other buildings, other structures in that block. So the interaction between the building and the block is a, a spontaneous phenomenon. That is to say the architect might take into account how that building fits in with the others but he or she cannot be certain what that interaction will be, particularly over time. That block in turn uh, interacts with other blocks to form a neighborhood, and people interact with each other from block to block to uh, create a neighborhood. The neighborhoods collectively form a district, the district collectively then form a city. So what, what I'm, my point here is that there is an emergence or a spontaneity that occurs out of design at a particular level, from the building to the block, to the neighborhood to the district. Let me show you a, a, an image that I hope uh, gets to that. Uh, I'll skip ahead just a bit. Here we go, I'll go back to what I just skipped over in a moment. But we have here, let's say this modern looking building that was uh, designed recently. These other buildings, buildings uh, to the right and particularly uh, to its left, were, were built obviously much earlier. Now, the one, uh, the architect who constructed the building to the left, the yellow one, uh, looks like a residence, probably didn't um, anticipate and couldn't have anticipated how other buildings on that block would interact with it, particularly in the future. Other buildings may have existed but there may be probably something else beside that yellow building that was torn down and was uh, replaced by this modern structure. These buildings together, however, fit together in a particular way that nobody designed, but there is an order here. Now, part of that order is imposed. There's a uniform setback, which is probably part of the zoning. However, the, or the, the heights, the, uh, and especially the uses of these buildings, were not uh, uh, dictated at any particular time. So we have a spontaneity and emergence here and, and an order. Let me go back to uh, what I skipped over and very briefly 
I'll be using the term complexity. And so let's uh, say something about uh, what we mean by complexity. The degree of complexity, again, this is from Hayek, refers to the minimum number of elements of which an instance of the pattern consists in order to exhibit all the character, excuse me, characteristic attributes of the class of patterns in question. Okay, so what does that mean? Suppose you take a piece of paper and you draw a circle on that paper and you put two horizontal dots at the top. If you show that to a child, the child might say, oh, that's a face. And especially if you were to draw a line toward the bottom of that circle, yeah, as a mouth, you have two eyes and a mouth, that's a face. So the number of elements is relatively limited, let's say to four elements, the circle, the two eyes, and the mouth to represent a face. If you were to try though to, to uh, produce a, an actual face, let's say um, Dr. Ferlito's face, you'd have to add many, many more elements to it in order to reach the degree of complexity to uh, be characteristic attributes, to achieve the level of an image that would be recognizably uh, Dr. Ferlito. So the degree of complexity depends on the number of minim minimum number of elements that is necessary to embody the essence of that thing. Uh, so the design, the degree of design is related to that, right? The number of elements that you introduce uh, the architect, for example, or the planner to realize a specific pattern in that given space. Okay. So here's what I was saying before, you have a, a single building within a diverse block that represents a planned order. That building design has an important but indirect unplanned influence on the way the other buildings in that block are later designed or used. Um, and so the, the block itself has many more design elements than the building uh, that, uh, and that those design elements uh, evolve or emerge over time. So the, is, this influence, may be imagined but not predicted because it emerges from the complex interaction of many minds within that space and the result is a spontaneous order. So the larger the scale of the structure, you go from a single building on a block with other individual buildings to something like this, larger scale uh, building, an apartment complex with mixed use on the bottom, but it's all planned all at once, and it, and it takes up the entire block. You're substituting the uh, intelligence of the planner or the architect for the multiple intelligences of people uh, in is building separate uh, constructions over time. There's a greater degree of complexity, a greater degree of granularity in this set of buildings than there is in this building. And then if you scale up, this is Hudson Yards in New York, a relatively recent development um, on 26 acres. Now, clearly this is not monolithic. However, the project is uh, in a sense monolithic. Uh, these buildings and structures were designed by different architects, but in roughly the same era, you know, you would be able to tell that uh, even though the, the particular designs may be uh, stylistically quite different from each other, they want to achieve a particular goal, but they're stylistically different, you'd be able to tell that they're from a particular era. You know, contrast these buildings with the building in the back, which is the, the iconic Empire State Building. Right? There's no mistaking that this building, the Empire State Building, is different from these buildings here, right? which are all, even though, uh, the result of different minds are these different architects are influenced by the same historical more or less era and experiences. You scale up even farther, <clears throat> this is a, a uh, planned city in China, uh, which you know has uh, some uh, degree of, uh, of uh, differentiation, mainly in color rather than pattern. But you've, you've gone beyond 26 uh, acres uh, or, or about 10 hectares 
uh, to something very massive. And as you do that, the homogeneity of the elements uh, become uh, much more prominent. Uh, you, you have to, for various reasons, uh, it's, when you're gonna build on this scale, the cost of differentiation is enormous. And so homogeneity uh, of, the, uh, of what you're building uh, usually takes precedence. And then um, many of you recognize the example of a, a palm, one of the palm islands in Dubai, clearly um, designed to be viewed from a distance. The beauty, uh, the work of art here, the art artistry, uh, is not up close. It's from a distance, not from a scale that uh, will be used by the, the people, but from sort of an architectural or sort of art artistic uh, perspective. Okay, so let me uh, contrast that with um, this, which I think many of you would recognize, Kowloon Walled City, which no longer exists, but um, uh, many of you know it, it was a, a vertical slum created on the outskirts of Hong Kong. Vertical, obviously, because the uh, real estate uh, is so scarce there and price is very high. But this is a slum, a structure that is clearly organic. Uh, very, uh, I think most people would on first glance find this to be extremely ugly and unattractive. Um, not, uh, not artistry. Um, because it was built up over time and was not intended to be looked at as a whole from a distance, but was a result of human action, but not of human design. Here's another shot of that in context, surrounded by uh, much wealthier structures uh, occupied by rich people. So you have the slum bordered by the this, these constructions. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, of course, but what I'm pointing out here is the design of these structures along the edge, um, clearly from a, a particular uh, uh, architectural group or, or, or studio versus the uh, Kowloon Walled City itself, which is an emergent phenomenon. Spontaneity versus design, scale, versus complexity. I think you would say that Kowloon uh, is much more complex than the surrounding structures. And you might say, well, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a slum. If you look inside, inside you see uh, the lower left, it looks much like the, a scene from Blade Runner um, here as well. But they're also, what's, what's happening if people have businesses, uh, they, they live there. Uh, many uh, hundreds or thousands of people live there interacting, um, living, uh, many of them, not all of them, decent lives, but the, the point is that they are poor. When it was destroyed um, in the 1990s, Kowloon was destroyed, uh, the people who lived there uh, were out of work uh, and became much poorer, had nowhere to live. Another thing to take into account here is the element of time. Um, Houseman's Paris, uh, which was uh, cut into the city of Paris in the mid 19th century, roughly 1850 to 1870, under the uh, direction of Baron Haussmann and Napoleon III. Here's the Champ Elysees, the um, Arc of Triumph, uh, clearly uh, something that was not organic, but it is a beautiful city. No one denies that. These, these, uh, these patterns are. Uh, when you look up close, are quite striking and lovely. Um, you can, if you search on the internet, you can see contrasts like this. This is a, a part of Paris before and after Haussmann. Okay, so the, the modern view uh, it looks quite nice. Um, I found this image uh, of Paris in, in a boulevard that was uh, just after it was uh, constructed around 1870, according to the caption. And something like, I don't know if this is the, the same place uh, today. Okay, now, don't be deceived by the color. Obviously, it looks much nicer with the color. But my point is that the element of time allows people to adjust to the um, 
built environment, but also to address the built environment itself. One of the things that, that uh, planners uh, up until recently did was to um, dictate what the form of the construction would be. Was Hausman uh, built these, uh, these uh, structures uh, and they all look fairly alike. Uh, they all have uniform setbacks, heights, and so forth to achieve this kind of harmony. Uh, so we might call this form-based zoning today. But he didn't uh, dictate what the uses would be. So we, don't, we didn't have uh, uh, functional zoning until fairly recently. Okay, so contrast that with the new construction, which ra looks rather raw. This actually may be an artificial image, so it looks, probably looks nicer than it actually is. Um, all right, so let me get a little bit more abstract and bring us to the comparison more explicitly. This, this diagram has two axes. The horizontal axis gives you the scale of a project. Think of this in terms of urban planning. You're planning for a, uh, a large district in a city. And uh, up on the vertical axis, we have complexity and spontaneous order. Let's uh, uh, do that uh, comparison. What are, are these two lines represent, for example, point A to point B, the line AB represents a trade-off between the complexity that uh, a, a uh, district has and the scale that the planner uh, plans to, to uh, build, um, uh, build on. So for example, as you, as you go toward this, this uh, origin, up this uh, line, the scale, the size of what you're planning uh, shrinks. So you go from uh, the entire city to smaller districts, to neighborhoods, to blocks, to individual buildings. So if the planner is just simply building an individual building, fit among other individual buildings, the, the level of complexity, interaction, and organic emergence is, is quite high. The, the larger the scale the, the, uh, the planner uh, plans for, from individual building to block to neighborhood to district to the entire city, the, the level of complexity and spontaneous order shrinks. The other line, A prime B, represents the following relationship. At any scale, let's say the district scale here, uh, at the moment the construction is made at that particular year or, or era, you have the um, level of complexity that is allowed, but over time that complexity can increase. So that's that distance here. Another relationship is between uh, the design itself and the complexity of the order. So here, you imagine you have a, a completely negative space. In other words, there's nothing in it and there's no design. Well, you have to have some uh, design element, uh, property boundaries, for example, in order for there to be any planning and successful, a successful planning and complexity to emerge from that. So after some minimum amount of uh, design, you move this way to the right, more and more design elements contributed by the planner for a given, let's say for a given block, that those design elements complement the plans of those individuals. It, it, it enables them to uh, carry out their plans. It, it contributes to the spontaneous order. So for example, if you have uh, rules that forbid uh, uh, aggression, or, or you establish certain property rights formally, or you have rules that uh, uh, try to minimize the amount of, of um, spillover and uh, noise and pollutants. That, that certainly would contribute to overall spun, uh, complexity and social order. But beyond some point for a given uh, block, let's say, if you try to minutely plan, such as that, 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 that uh, large uh, block size uh, 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 construction that I, I showed you earlier, if you try to go farther and farther, the level of spontaneity and complexity 
begins to fall. So beyond some point, we can call it you know, point D star here. The design, the more you design, the less spontaneity and complexity there will be until you've, you've eliminated it entirely. You forbid, it's like the, the parade grounds in Pyongyang. What is not mandated is forbidden. And those are the two diagrams compared, which I can go back to later if, if you like. So living cities then cannot be uniformly planned this way, that is cities in, in Jacobs' sense, and they can't be efficient. Why, why can't they be efficient? <clears throat> what is the standard of success in this case? It's not efficiency, not, it's not the economist concept of efficiency. Um, the architect Rem Koolhaas, in his book, Delirious New York, makes this statement. And this is about Manhattan, but uh, I think it applies to any great city. He says, the entire spectacle that defines the dark side of metropolis as an astronomical increase in the potential for disaster, only just exceeded by an equally astronomical increase in the ability to avert it. So you have elements that are trying to break out, creative elements that are disruptive, but then you have other elements such as entrepreneurship and uh, people who are seeking opportunities that coordinate and, and make these diverse elements complement, complementary. So there's, there is a, um, and that's, you know, the experimentation and trial and error that cities um, foster. You know, why do you need to experiment? You experiment because you don't, you're not sure what the outcome will be. You're not, you don't have uh, the answer. So you try different things. You have successes, but mostly failure. And those failures entail uh, disorder. They entail um, smells and co conflict, but that's a, a, an accompaniment, necessary accompaniment to innovation and creativity. If you try to eliminate that messiness, then you're going to destroy the basis for creativity and innovation. You can't have innovation uh, economic development without that messiness. In her book, The Economy of Cities, Jacobs makes this statement. She says, I propose to argue that these grave and real deficiencies, the sort of uh, apparent disorder that I was mentioning earlier, these grave and real deficiencies are necessary to economic development and thus are exactly what makes cities uniquely valuable to economic life. By this, I do not mean that cities are economically valuable in spite of their inefficiency and impracticality, but rather because they are inefficient and impractical. Right? What does inefficiency and impracticality consist of? It consists of experiment, of trial and error. That's why we come to cities, uh, to test our ideas, to search for opportunities. I have a final thought as I close. And that is the more precise and comprehensive your image of a city is, the less likely that what you're imagining really is a city. And the less likely that what issues from that image The city is not a man-made thing. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you very much. Very much appreciated and very insightful presentation. And very abstract. I hope we can get to um, more concrete issues. Well, yeah, abstract, but I, I don't know. I think that uh, probably each one of us, when you were talking, could have uh, um, access to memories that uh, link uh, those abstract thoughts with uh, uh, present experiences. And in particular, in the last part of your presentation, it came to my mind that uh, basically in these days mark uh, the 10th anniversary of the first time that I landed in Jakarta. 
at, at that time I was still uh, living in Italy and I had a business trip in Indonesia and was my first time uh, in Asia at all and my first time in a megalopoly. You know, I was used to the very beautiful and uh, uh, artistic uh, Italian cities. You have shown some piazzas uh, before. And imagine in landing in, in Jakarta in this massive airport and taking a taxi and the taxi, the way I know to reach the hotel is more or less a couple of hours by taxi, depends on traffic, a couple of hours. In, in Italy, in a couple of hours, I've changed three regions, uh, <laughs> you know. And, and I hated the city because there was no actual city center, something that we can call a city center in the Italian sense, and was messy and traffic. But then slowly, slowly, I came to appreciate the, the vibrant life that was there. So the, the, lack, the lack of efficiency of Jakarta on time, in time, became what actually attracted me about Jakarta. So is a, a lot of uh, life coming up from every corner of the city. In, in the end, I ended up marrying a woman from Jakarta. I, I have a house in Jakarta, so every time I can escape, uh, I have some holiday, I go to Jakarta. And that life uh, became part of me. And now I think, uh, you know, Shakespeare wrote that there is no life outside the walls of Verona, which is uh, my hometown in Italy. And now I, I write the same every time I leave Jakarta after an holiday, there is no life outside the walls of Jakarta. So it came so much to my, to my heart. So I think that um, what you have mentioned is not, is not that abstract after all. Uh, no, Glad to hear that. <laughs> so at least for me, I mean, I've been in so many, but even I have been in megalopolis like Dhaka, uh, which is even much worse than Jakarta in terms of smell, pollution, and in traffic, um, you can't have more than two meetings in a day in Dhaka because you, you, you can't move around more than that. And, and indeed, the more you discover the city, the more you find corners that become familiar, you know? So probably this is also part of the beauty. I mean, they, they are chaos, which is pot potential source of life. In the, in the order, like, like you show in a parade, there is no life. Uh, you know. No, that no, that's 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 right. And I would say that um, you know any uh, real city does have its its elements of of um, organic life and beauty, um, even those that are that are completely planned. And usually, though, in in you know in the interstices, in between the, the planned elements, is, is where the the life uh, uh, begins. Sometimes it's, it it remains there. Uh, but if you uh, you have to look for it, whereas in other places, you know, it's all around you. Yeah, it depends on it depends on whether the the built environment and and the rules that people use uh, en enable and and um, promote that kind of uh, flourishing. Indeed, indeed. So now we we open the floor for the Q and A uh, for the ones who feel not confident to to type in English. Feel free to to type in in Bas Indonesia. We can uh, we can have a translation. Before I, I go, I see that some questions are already coming in. Um, I would like to uh, to mention um, the, the issue of COVID, which is very much present in in our lives. At the end of the presentation, you mentioned uh, in the quotation for about Manhattan. Indeed, this uh, conflict between uh, disasters uh, pending over uh, a big city and the capacity of a big city to, uh, to, to face them, to handle them. What are we experiencing now that indeed is, uh, is evident in the United States, but was the same in Italy, where, where, where big cities indeed uh, look more affected uh, by, this, uh, by this issue? Will they have, they will find their inner force uh, to fight back? Uh, you know, I think the short answer is, uh, is yes. Right? If and, and the degree of success in, in fighting back will depend on um, how flexible the governance structures 
allow the, the people who are uh, living in these cities to adjust. Um, I mean, this, the, the pandemic will be the source of, of countless uh, books and dissertations and articles in, in years to come because it is such a, there's so many aspects to it. Uh, let me just, let me, let me take, um, let me take two things. Uh, one is you, you touched on the relationship between uh, density and the spread of uh, the disease. Um, and I want to make a point that Jane Jacobs um, uh, stresses. And her point is the difference between density, that is the, the number of persons per hectare, uh, versus overcrowding in a given structure. And so you may have <clears throat> an extremely dense uh, district, let's say the Minato district in central Tokyo, uh, where you may have a single person living in a very, very small flat of, um, I don't know, uh, uh, 200 square feet or, or so, just a, basically a closet, a, uh, you know, 20, 20, 20 uh, square meters, whatever that it may be, whatever is permitted. Uh, and you may have uh, many of these clustered in, in a high rise, and so the density is extremely high. Well, um, that sort of uh, density um, is different from having, let's say, uh, five or six people uh, intergenerationally living in a flat of, let's say, a thousand square feet uh, that is uh, you know, five times larger, because th you, that, that is a, a situation in which you're coming into contact uh, every day, almost every moment, with people who may have to go out and, and work and come back in. And so that kind of overcrowding within a particular unit um, is, uh, I think, a, a major source of the spread of this. I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist, and, and I'm just, I, I, I've seen uh, some research, but I think the research is still at the, at, you know, right now, uh, uh, premature or very early. But that seems reasonable. So let me just make the point between density per se and overcrowding. And overcrowding is a, a largely uh, a function of income. And so you tend to see overcrowding, many, many people, many generations living in the same dwelling where uh, there are poor people. And indeed, this is what you see, at least in New York. In the poorer neighborhoods, the uh, COVID-19 has spread much more rapidly. This infection rate is much higher than in wealthy neighborhoods. So one of the, I think, the wealthiest neighborhood in New York City is the Upper East Side. It's also one of the densest in terms of population, in terms of number of units per, per hectare. Uh, and it has one of the lowest, if not the lowest, uh, infection rate. So, the, and, and the second thing, so density versus overcrowding. The second point I would like to make with respect to the pandemic and in terms of flexibility, it's just one example. Um, I live in Brooklyn. I walked out onto uh, Montague Street, which is a nearby street in my neighborhood. And the city has permitted restaurants to spread out into the street. Montague Street is your typical 60 foot wide street, but what they've uh, allowed restaurants to do uh, that don't have large interiors is to put tables on the sidewalk, but also to extend barriers all oh, about one third of the way or one half into the street so that people can sit outside. This is totally against uh, zoning regulations, right? But um, in this particular instance, um, the rules were flexible enough to let people to adjust, make a living, to enjoy restaurant uh, dining, which you know, most of us still haven't uh, experienced in four months. And as I say, business to businesses to uh, continue to operate in some way. So that's just one example of what I mean by flexibility of the structure and flexibility of rules. Okay, let's start with the Q&A from the public. So following very Traditional Ubi Mayor Minor Chessat. I will start with a question from Professor Alain Berthaud, who is asking, do you think that in planning new neighborhoods or new cities, the small size of the lots are key in maintaining spontaneous order? For instance, the small lots in the planning of the grid were key in creating diversity 
and spontaneous order in an otherwise uniform rigid grid? Um, yes, I think that's uh, I think that's right. Um, uh, urbanists and, and um, planners use this term granularity, uh, which refers to the the, the uh, degree to which uh, there are di different uh, uses within a particular uh, geographic area. And I showed you the the image in my presentation of a single building within a block. Uh, there are different uses, different uh, uh, entrances within that block uh, for these, these different uses. Um, and it's that diversity of land use. Um, and this is, again, something that Jane Jacobs emphasized in, in her um, Death and Life of Great American Cities. The diversity of land use is a uh, resource that people in cities can draw on to be creative. That is to say, you can you're exp you walk along a particular block and there's, it's all the same building, right? All a supermarket or warehouse or even an apartment building, uh, it, it lacks interest and there's not much, you know, not, not much combination you can do there. But if, if there's a residence, if there's a law office, if there's a laundromat, if there's a, you, know, you name it, right? Some kind of dry goods store, uh, you know, that, that gives you an opportunity to combine different uses, however mundane they may be, uh, in one single trip. So yes, I, I think it's, uh, if, if the, um, uh, uh, the uh, planning uh, is, uh, you know, let's say more form-based or scale-based than functional-based, that is to say, you know, you, you limit uh, the, 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 the size of the lots, uh, that could encourage. Now, of course, you know you can go to an extreme this way, and and you know where do, where where is the uh, wh what's the optimal uh, size of lots? And and you know, I think the answer is uh, we don't know. And even if we were to find it at a particular time, it might change over time. So I think uh, uh, what uh, Professor Bateau has uh, emphasized is that planners, um, whether you're private or planner, uh, uh, public planners, he emphasizes public planning. More have to uh, monitor what is going on uh, there. What it, you know, for example, you look at the variables of uh, per capita income. Uh, you look at some uh, measure of liveliness, uh, diversity, and see whether in fact that's that's happening. Uh, that that's 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 very important. Uh, Chandra, can, <clears throat> Chandra, can you translate the question from Ivan Sandra, Saya Sangan Tertari Dengan Presentasi Tadi? So we okay. give a uh, floor to some. Uh, Which was it? Okay. Yeah. Hola. Yeah, man. Saya sangat tertarik dengan presentasi tadi. Awalnya saya kira kota yang bagus adalah kota yang terencana secara detail sehingga mampu menggardikan kehidupan di dalamnya. Namun, do you find it? Or <laughs> I have to read it all? <laughs> the microphone. You you are mute. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Not yet. I will find it and uh, maybe I will uh, give the question later. So okay, you, so you can from, continue okay. to the floor, I think. Ivan Sandra, yeah? Yeah, Ivan. Ivan Sandra. Um, one interesting question uh, from Emil Ponev. Is there a difference between a spontaneous order and an emergent order? Um, I think there is. There, there are different definitions of spontaneous order and emergence. Um, um, the economist David Harper from New York University has written um, a couple of articles um, categorizing the different ways that economists and other scientists use the term spontaneous order. He, here's how I see the difference. And uh, emergence um, is a property such that um, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the, the parts. So for example, if you take the individual letters, D, R, O, W, okay, in English, that's not a word, okay, but the individual letters have a meaning. There's you know, the, the letter D, R, O, W. Uh, each one has an has a, has a, uh, individual meaning, but if you, if you put them together and then reverse them, Mm -hmm. You have W-O-R-D, 
you have a, a word, which is the word word. And, the, and that word, the meaning of that is, is uh, different from the, has a property that's different from each of the elements. So the whole cannot be uh, decomposed mm -hmm. into the elements. And so, th so that's an example of an emergence, of emergence. Clearly, it's not spontaneous, right? Because I can write that word and I can mean a particular thing by that, by that word. But it, it, it does express what happens in a block when you have different buildings, as I was showing you earlier, and their interaction uh, to, to fit together. A spontaneous order is emergent in that sense, but it, it, uh, I, I see it as taking place through time and it is unintentional. So you can have, for example, a chemical compound, a drug, that is an emergent order, but it has to be very, very carefully planned and executed in order for that drug, uh, whether it's ibuprofen, let's say, uh, so that'd be successful and not poisonous. Okay, but it's not spontaneous. It's a, but a city, a language, a culture, a law, that is spontaneous because the order that emerges was not planned by anyone. So we have an unplanned order, which is emergent, but you also have emergent orders which are planned, if that makes sense. They're not the same thing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, another interesting question from Johanna Zurmach. Um, oh. she, she mentioned that uh, indeed there has been a flourishing uh, literature about spontane spontaneity and spontaneous order, but these ideas struggle against the central planning orthodoxy. So what do you think prevents spontaneous order from being spontaneously embraced? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, let me go back to Jacobs, if I may. You know, she criticized people like Robert Moses, who was a great mm -hmm. urban planner uh, great in terms of his influence uh, on New York City and the state of New York um, for not seeing the intricacy and um, underlying spontaneous orders of sea. Uh, Jacobs did not use the term spontaneous order, by the way. Uh, mm. She used related terms, um, for example, organized complexity. But anyway, the, 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 the criticism, I think, is essentially the same. Okay, wh why? Uh, did they, why, why did he ignore this? And um, her explanation is that, well, when planners go to, to, to uh, school, they, uh, to learn planning, they, they, they look at it in a particular way. They treat a city as a, as a simple problem, not as a complex problem. Okay, uh, uh, Joanna's question is, well, uh, you know, there's been 50 years since the publication of that book and, and um, and in many programs, uh, uh, her book is read. So why haven't planners adopted that, that, that point of view? I, I don't know, uh, but I, I suspect, you know, if you are an architect, for example, uh, I, I think that you have an ambition not to build small, but to build large. And in some ways, the success of an architect is measured along the dimension of how large the development or the pro project that you're working on is. Yeah, you know, I don't know, there aren't too many architects, maybe some, um, who or get famous simply by building small structures. But I think the great ones, uh, Philip Johnson, Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright, um, uh, are famous because they build, build large. And so here we have that trade-off between scale and spontaneity that I tried to illustrate with the, with the diagram and through those images. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is that it's, it's sort of um, driven by ambition, mm -hmm. uh, a kind of hubris uh, that uh, you can create a development, you can create a city uh, in the same way that you can create a building. And this, I think this is, this is a uh, terrible mistake. Um, what, you, what you can build is a place, is, dorm, is a dormitory, or you can, uh, on that scale, right? A, a very a bedroom city, or a workplace, or a Disneyland. 
but you cannot build a city in Jacobs' sense, a city of innovation, of creativity, of process in that fashion. And as the mind of the planner or the architect um, substitutes for the, the multiple intelligences of people who are organically creating that city, the, the less spontaneous that city is going to be. Thank you. So I can see here that the, the question from uh, Ivan Sandra has been translated. It's quite interesting indeed because uh, it emphasizes on, uh, um, uh, on the role of the human element. So it's saying that, uh, okay, thanks for the presentation. Um, um, I, I think that a good city is a city that I was thinking that a good city is a city that uh, were uh, planned in details, uh, independently from the individual uh, ways of living. But in the end, the life and interaction of each citizen is the one, uh, is the element that gives the city uh, its vibrant life. Uh, what's your opinion on, on it? Well, I, I think that's, that's essentially, if I understand the question, my message that the life of the city you know, percolates up. It, it comes from, from the bottom up rather than the top down. Now, I don't want to say that uh, you know, planning is not necessary. Uh, we can talk about public planning or private planning within a, a, given, a given project. You, you, know, you do need um, conscious planning um, at some level to enable, to complement the individual spontaneity. So for example, I mentioned earlier uh, in terms of the uh, physical infrastructure, uh, you need some roads or pathways. Uh, you need uh, to be able to provide water and lighting and, and uh, waste disposal and that sort of thing. Now, there are different ways of doing that. Some of those don't require large-scale planning, uh, but you need to to uh, at least think ahead that these these things are necessary and um, and, and uh, provide provide for them directly or indirectly. So you're you are in this way uh, complementing. Um, the uh, emergence over time of this unplanned order. Now, um, you know, uh, think about uh, mo mobility, the, the ease of getting from one place to another, the low cost of getting from one place to another, um, right? You need to uh, enable that to, ha that to happen. And that uh, would, would take some form of, of, of overall planning. Again, not necessarily uh, government planning, but uh, but there, there needs to be that provision. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we have another question about uh, um, um, the pandemic, and um, uh, an attendee is asking how the pandemic uh, affects urban planning studies, um, or if they should be affected at all as a city is a uh, spontaneous order. And then he's asking also if uh, our cities are, are ready to face any bigger uh, health crisis in the future. Um, so I, I, I have, to, have to say explicitly, I'm not a, a, a urban planner. I'm not, never trained as an urban planner. I, uh, what, what, I, what I learned about uh, urban planning, I've read in books and articles and, and talking to urban planners. Um, so, um, but I don't want to, uh, sidestep the question. Uh, the urban planners I've I've spoken to uh, have uh, said that well, there there is probably not very much that urban planners can do positively to uh, adjust to the pandemic. I mean, you don't know where the next disaster is coming from. You know, you could say, for example, in New York, one of the problems is there's not enough outdoor space for restaurants to expand into so that uh, uh, you might zone then the, uh, uh, the spaces to be smaller but, and, then, and then have larger out, outdoor spaces. You might then mandate uh, uh, some ratio, uh, minimum ratio of um, outdoor space uh, to indoor space. Okay, well, that might address this particular problem. But then what if there's a, a hurricane? 
right? And so the people need shelter from the rain and from the elements. So there's very, you have to crowd into these small spaces and all the uh, uh, structures and tables and things that are outside get, get blown away and are relatively unprotected. I mean, that, that's a trivial example, but it, I think it, it, uh, it gets to what I'm saying. You can't prepare for the next disaster based on what happened before. But what you can do, and I think what you have to do, is to um, embed flexibility or to enable flexibility within those rules. And this, this takes um, uh, constant monitoring. Um, if, if the city government is looking at uh, what successful strategies to take in the event of different uh, disasters or uh, diff different eventualities, um, well, I think that's fine. Um, but not knowing, you know, what, what is going to happen, uh, they have to be able to say, well, you know, we're not going to uh, dictate uh, what exactly the uh, individual businesses and residences should do. Some things, like if you anticipate that the waters are going to be rising due to, uh, you know, a climate change or something like that, and obviously uh, uh, this is something that... Uh, uh, um, uh, the um, they're looking at in Jakarta. Um, you know, th then you need to you need to uh, take that into account. That's something that's more immediate. But in terms of these other things, the pandemics, and you know, I from what I've read, we can probably expect there to be uh, more pandemics because of the um, global nature of uh, of trade and the mobility, the global mobility of, of individuals. So, you know, there, there are ways, I'm not saying you shouldn't do anything, right? You can, you can prepare for these things, but in terms of large scale planning, uh, from, from what I understand uh, from people who know much more than I do, uh, uh, you're much more limited in that way. And so flexibility is the key. Thank you. Carmelo. Uh, yes. Carmelo. Yes, I please. I think I have a, a question. I think it's the most important question for, for me about mm -hmm. our research. So let me uh, give the question to Professor Ikeda. Uh, Professor Ikeda, uh, interesting presentation there. Maybe Dr. Carmelo had told us about the moving of new capital city of Indonesia to another area, to another island. It's quite far from Jakarta. So what is your opinion or do you think uh, about the, the plan of Indonesian government to move the new capital city to another area? Uh, in, uh, in general, uh, uh, you can tell us for the many aspects, especially in from your uh, we are talk. Thank you. Well, um, well I, I, I uh, not... Uh, I don't feel myself uh, terribly qualified to answer that specific question. Um, but um, I think what I can say is first of all, you know, what it is, what is it you're trying to achieve? Um, are you simply trying to move the government out of uh, Jakarta to someplace that's, uh, let's say, safer, if, that's, if that is the motive. There may be other motives. Uh, I haven't studied this, uh, this in, in detail. Ones that uh, may be uh, more economic or political even in, in nature. But let's say it, it has to do with the environmental safety. Uh, are you, do you just want to move, do you want to move, are you trying to move uh, the, the, the entire city, not just the government, but the, the businesses, residences, culture, to a new location? Um, uh, you know, I, I would say that that is, uh, if that's what your goal is, um, that uh, cannot be planned. That that's um, you know very wishful thinking, Isn't, which is not to say you cannot establish something that might later become a city. And what I've learned from Alain Berto, um, and uh, is that uh, if you're going to do something like that, it's best to locate uh, uh, next to. Um, uh, an existing settlement, uh, because uh, in, you know if you have to travel uh, two hours or or even fly uh, to uh, achieve a to 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 get to a particular uh, city, 
it's not going to be a city, right? You need mobility not only within the city, but from that city to other places. Um, but may, maybe that's not what you want to do. Maybe you want to isolate the, 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 the government structures from other structures, in which case you, you know, building something like a fortress, uh, that would be, then that would be appropriate. But uh, probably that's not, uh, that may not be what you want to do. So you need to uh, uh, build the capacity for future development uh, economic development, uh, again, following a Jacobs definition of a city, um, to wherever you're going to move to. And so, and so accessibility, mobility, people, a city is a place where people want to get to and a place where they want to stay, right? You have to attract them, they have to want to stay there. What does that entail? Well, not just a job, but livability, a uh, place to live, entertainment, culture, you know, people want to, to have a rich, fulfilling life there. If they can't get it there, even if they're forced to move there by, you know, because they're part of the government, they're not going to stay there, right? The, the city will empty on the weekends, uh, just as we saw in, in other examples of this happening, like Brasilia. Uh, people, uh, it empties. Uh, but, you know, if that's, you know, if, if what you want to achieve is not a city in, in the sense of a living city, then, you know, that may be okay. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, we we analyze this topic in, in yeah, our yeah. In, in our paper, and even if we look at the perspective of uh, uh, solving some problems that are often mentioned when uh, the relocation of the Indonesian capital city is discussed, like pollution and traffic, um, such a solution is meaningless because um, I have calculated that moving the old civil servants with the family. Uh, out of Jakarta will mean to move around uh, seven to eight hundred thousand people out of the city in a city that has 20 million. So you are not going to solve the traffic problem, you are not going to solve the sinking problem, uh, you are not going to solve the pollution problem. So um, it's just a claim that that doesn't work just with simple math, you know. Yeah. And uh, uh, an interest to, to become uh, even a source of additional costs, because if the center of the bureaucracy is uh, in, a, in a remote place in the Mo Borneo Island, uh, and you are a business owner and you need uh, a rubber stamp for your permissions, for your businesses, whatever, and you need to fly two hours. Two hours, yeah. And this rubber more, stamp, yeah, more or less two hours. Is, is make, making your business inconvenient, you know, or you have to have uh, basically a branch office in that place just to take care of your paperwork. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so adding costs for for businesses, adding costs for for politics as well, because I think we can't realistically believe that politicians would move uh, uh, in a remote area and live there happily. They will probably have to conduct a double life in the remote area and in the in the old capital city. So adding costs to the taxpayers. In, in the end. So uh, I think that our idea is that the project as it is conceived doesn't really have a meaning from, from many perspectives. But um, let me move uh, uh, to another question. Uh, meanwhile, okay. if you can translate the question from Solihan, uh, and um, I, I will move to another one which is in English. And is, uh, uh, what is it here, is a, is a question with a Schumpeterian touch. Uh, so do rise of technology such AI, big data, self-driving car uh, add flavor to the future of spontaneity of the city? Um, I think it certainly could. I mean, you know, um, the, um, you know, one of the problems that plague most cities is, is the problem of traffic and mobility. And um, autonomous vehicles uh, might be a way of um, addressing that problem. It, it may also address the problem of pandemics because uh, the, the subways in New York uh, might be a, 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 a place where the, the spread of, of, of COVID-19 um, was very prevalent. There, there were a great number, there were a number of, uh, a large number, uh, a tragic number of uh, subway employees who came down uh, 
with the disease, working in that confined space. And some, I think other studies have shown that the subway may be a contributor, although um, others uh, studies have, have uh, contradicted that. Nevertheless, if, if uh, such uh, conveyances, mass transport, that form of mass transport uh, is a problem in uh, future pandemics, then something like uh, autonomous vehicles, which we're just you know, experimenting, experimenting with now, uh, and we're allowed to evolve in you know, 10 or 20 years, uh, that could certainly, I think, uh, uh, be an alternative. Uh, and the subway tunnels could be you know, transformed into something else. Uh, who knows? But uh, yeah, I, I think uh, uh, you know, if we look at um, the way technology has complemented uh, livability in cities, the smartphone, uh, computer, uh, and so forth, then um, uh, I, you know, it certainly it certainly is uh, possible, if not likely, that it would uh, promote uh, greater spontaneity and complexity. Thank you. There is a, a quite an interesting question. Uh, I think that is more related with personal preferences, but uh, maybe you, you can tell us your view. From uh, Sugi Sugiharto Pujankoro is asking, which are the best characteristics for uh, for an ideal city, and where can I find the best city in the world? <laughs> <laughs> it's quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, that, that certainly is a a matter of personal preferences. I mean, some people don't like cities at all. My father was one of them. He he didn't uh, he didn't like it. Um, I, I tend to approach it from the other way. Uh, that um, uh, any city that aspires to greatness, or any city that is great, has something to offend everyone, and that's because of its diversity. Right? People go to cities in order to pursue opportunities because they want to, I don't know, maybe transform themselves. They want to get a new job. They want a new lifestyle. But since everyone is different, that means you have a diversity of lifestyles, a diversity of elements in the city. And often these are very extreme, right? And, and it's in great cities that you see extremes of lifestyles, extremes of services and products that you don't see in smaller cities, certainly not small towns. Um, so I don't know, uh, you know, the, 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 the greater the attraction, the greater the attraction of the city, the larger population, then the more likely it is that there will be um, many opportunities to, to be disgusted and, and offended, as, as well as to be attracted and charmed and fulfilled. Maybe I can help Prof. Ikeda to answer the question. Uh, refer to the publication earlier that, that Ubud in Bali is one of the best city in the world. <laughs> yeah. 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 As, as, as Professor Keller said, in fact, it's a matter of preferences because if I look at myself, I'd rather live in, in Jakarta than in Bali. Yeah. Even if uh, many people love Bali as a places with beaches and these kind of things, but I like the Jakarta more. The mess of Jakarta. <laughs> a, I like more to surf the waves of chaos than the waves of sea. Yeah. <laughs> so One day we, I think we will invite Prof. Ikeda to Jakarta. Have you ever been here? I've not, and I would, uh, I would uh, relish the chance to do that. Maybe you can feel the same with Dr. Carmelo. Yes, uh, hopefully <laughs> once uh, the borders are open, because uh, yeah, at, at the moment we can't go anywhere. We can just, within the same country, we are, it seems that we are back in time, yeah, with the mobility around the world, uh. <laughs> except Europe where internal movements are allowed in this region, despite COVID has been much milder here, yeah. uh, we, we, we can't really go anywhere. And, and I, me as a foreigner here, I'm even not allowed to go to the church. So <laughs> imagine if I can go, because I'm a foreigner, and as a foreigner, I'm virus bearer. So, <laughs> so, so I, I can't even go to the church next to my house. So, 
okay, so move to, to other questions. There is the first question, which is quite interesting, uh, made of three sub-questions. How do you convince someone that complexity is de desirable? Uh, by what data was the graph uh, with the trade-off between complexity and degree of design construct con constructed? And uh, if you can mention the inefficiency and impracticabilities that are necessary for a city. Well, those are very good questions. Um, uh, for, about the data question, I have no data. <laughs> that is to say, um, this is something, I mean, in a way it's, it's like um, uh, the demand curve sloping down, right? We, the the trade-off between uh, price and, and, and quantity demanded uh, is something that is uh, you know, derived from, from principles, but it's also uh, uh, verified by um, experiment. Uh, if, you, if you follow Vernon Smith and his uh, experiments with uh, empirical demand supply curves, but also just from daily experience that uh, other things equal, the more expensive something is, the less you're going to buy of it. The trade-off between spontaneity and, and planning is, is based on, on um, just the principle that the, the more that you uh, as a planner uh, substitute your plans for the myriad of plans that are um, out there in, in terms of use of space or economically in terms of what can be bought and sold, uh, uh, ipso facto, right? There's going to be less um, spontaneity and uh, the, um, uh, from that. Now, the empirical question is, well, uh, what is the slope of that curve? Or with respect to figure two, the one that had the look like a hill, you know, where is the where is the peak of that hill? If you remember that that diagram was a relationship between the uh, amount that you design, the degree of design, and the level of positive complexity and spontaneity. And it goes up as you design, but then it reaches a point and then it comes down. Uh, and, and so where the point is where where is that? Is that close, is that point close to the uh, close to the uh, uh, origin where you have very little design or is it closer to the other side we have a great deal of design um, uh, I don't know that that I think you could I mean I think one can conceptualize experiments that you could um, that you could um, conduct or at least measures that you could look for uh, but 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 that there is a portion of that uh, curve that is downward sloping, I think is 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 correct, or is is um, like the demand curve of of economics, is is one that is uh, conceptually derived. Um, so let me, so by way of pushing that aside, um, how how do you convince convince somebody that complexity is desirable? Well, if we think of complexity right as as multiple elements, take a supermarket. Right, uh, many people complain that markets uh, are are wasteful because you go into a supermarket and there are like uh, 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 ten different brands of cat food. Right, why do we need ten different brands of cat food? And within each brand, right, there's there's a dozen or more different categories for, for, for kittens, for adult cats, cats with uh, uh, digestive problems, cats with um, you know, uh, uh, dental problems. So you know, why, why do you need all of this complexity? Why not just, just have you know, cat food or, or, or limited? And, and so similarly, you know, why do cities have to, be, have, to have this complexity? Uh, why, can't they, why can't we plan them to be more simple? And the answer is then, then you wouldn't have people going to cities, right? You go to a particular supermarket because you know you can get that particular brand of, of cat food for your cat and not any other, right? You've tried different ones. And the ones that you've settled on seems to, to satisfy you your, or your cat via your, you know, what you think satisfies your cat um, and, and, and not another. And so if that brand were eliminated by a simplifying policy, uh, to reduce complexity, uh, that would certainly reduce your your pref your, satis your preference satisfactions. So that that's one way to put it, right? This the complexity is a function of diversity, and that diversity addresses your individual uh, preferences and lifestyle desires, and and your and and your 
seeking of opportunities. And then the question about uh, inefficiency and impracticality. Again, if you think of a city, not as a set of dwellings or a large number of people, but as a city of diversity where uh, that enables innovation and creativity to occur, then a city must necessarily be one where there's trial and error, right? Because you don't know what the solution is. And that, that, um, that groping uh, involves uh, what appears to be waste. You know, why, did, why don't you just go to the solution? Why don't you just go straight to the right cat food? Well, because you don't know, right? You're, you're trying one thing versus another. And that's messy. You try a business and it fails and it, the storefront is empty. Uh, or, or you try to build a, a, a building, another type of building, and it's uh, wildly successful, and that brings in large crowds, and and over, and uh, and so you're you have under capacity, um, and and so you you have to adjust to that. The inefficiency that exists in cities is simply a um, result of imperfect knowledge. And cities are places where um, we discover our imperfect knowledge, we discover that there are problems and there, they are places where we find solutions to those problems. That discovery and groping for solutions um, is uh, an inefficient one. Right? Efficiency implies that you have an objective and you have before you all the possible means to achieve that objective. Right? We don't have that. We don't have perfect knowledge. But cities are a venue for that, uh, for the discovery of that kind of knowledge, which is inefficient. Thank you. Um, I would go for a last group of questions, for a last question, because we're running out of time. We have been online for almost two hours. Um, so unfortunately, yes. I will have to, to, cut, uh, to cut a little bit uh, short. So before we conclude, is this group of questions which is interesting. Um, how the degree of planning and spontaneity can affect class divides? And would it follow that an increased level of planning would contribute to increase economic divides or would it actually contribute to reduce economic divides? Um. Well, you know, you could eliminate measured inequalities by mandate, right? You could, you could institute a plan which says everybody um, is assigned a job for which they are paid the same amount uh, and housing uh, will be provided uniformly uh, other necessities, food, even entertainment could be provided um, uniformly. So that's one way right, that planning can um, eliminate or at least try to eliminate inequalities. Um, as we know, this has been attempted um, to one degree or another. And uh, we have yet to see a success. Um, whether well, you're talking about uh, um, communist China or North Korea or the former Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, it, it has been attempted to, to be done this way. Now, that's probably not what the questioner has asked, but that, that's, that's one way of, of framing, framing, the, uh, framing the answer to that question. Um, so, uh, for me, um, the I think of uh, I think of opportunity um, as a way of achieving a kind of equality. Or to put it differently, you know, this this the attempt to um, provide equality of opportunity that everyone has a chance to to uh, uh, do better, at least materially, in life. I think is an ideal. I don't think that's been achieved anywhere. Uh, it may in some, you know, people may think in some ways that that may be a fantasy. 
uh, because we are born in different situations, different backgrounds, different capacities, intelligence, physical, um, whatever it may be, talents. Uh, but uh, so what, what in terms of policy, what we can do uh, is uh, from a planning perspective is to uh, um, create a, a, a set of rules that uh, maximize the chances of any given individual to achieve success, however that individual defines success. And so this um, places emphasis on individuality, individual uh, or freedom, uh, but it also means that you have to tolerate failure. And this is true of, you know, in all walks of life, right? It, 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 failure is, is difficult to tolerate, but you know, in, not only in yourself, but you see other people fail, you see businesses fail, you see policies fail, uh, but that is part and parcel of reality, right? So you, you want to create a con certain conditions, rules that enable people to um, minimize failure, to take chances, okay, in some ways to create the possibility of failure, but to minimize the, the, the risks of failure at the same time, rather than trying to uh, impose what, uh, you know, uh, Jacobs would call a pretended order. Um, so equality, trying to, trying to achieve an equality of, of opportunity, understanding that the playing field is never level. Right. You're going to, you have people who start very high, who fail, people start very low, who succeed, but you also, you know, people who start off high, who stay there, people who start off low, who stay there. But in, to try to create conditions where mobility is possible, fail where you um, have to, succeed where you can. I don't know, that, uh, that's uh, the best I can come up with. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that uh, <clears throat> we can conclude here. It has been a pleasure and I think we bring home um, a lot of uh, uh, useful insights for reflection and uh, interesting thoughts to apply to our own uh, realities. Of course, urban planning is part of the political discourse and here in Southeast Asia where probably cities are still growing compared to, to the Western reality, um, the, the real estate and the, the urban discussion is uh, probably deeper than what it is in the, in the West. And, uh, <clears throat> and I think um, that having seen mistakes and attempts from other parts of the world, probably this part of the world can benefit from that experience and, uh, and try alternative routes, or at least try to avoid to do the same mistakes that would be already quite a great achievement. Uh, so if we have seen someone, someone else failing on, on a certain way, why we should fall on the same, uh, on the same mistake. So, um, and uh, the role that we as a center for market education with uh, partners like Provalindo are trying to do is indeed uh, to, uh, to bring fresh points to the discussion and uh, fresh perspectives and uh, events like these are conceived uh, to help also the, uh, the discussion and the reflection in the, uh, in the political and uh, policy debate. Um, before we close, uh, and leaving also the word to Mr. Chandra for a final salutation, I would just like to remember to all the attendees that the certificate of participation together with Professor Ikeda's slides, uh, Professor Ikeda paper on what is a city, and uh, Provalindo paper on the moving of the new of the Indonesian capital city can be requested by contacting us, um, uh, looking at our contact details on the website marketedu.org, which I type now uh, in the uh, chat room. So on this website, you will find all our contact details, and you can request. Uh, the material that I just mentioned, uh, if you need it. 
So while um, before uh, we close, I will ask also the, um, the speaker, so Mr. Chandra and Professor Ikeda to, uh, to remain connected before uh, going out, while we wait for the attendees to exit uh, the room. And um, Chandra, if you want to, to say a final word, we appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Carmelo. Thank you to all participants, especially to Professor uh, Ikeda for your presentation. We are very appreciate and give us a lot of knowledge and insight. Also to my friend, Dr. Carmelo has already very, very uh, give, uh, give us the, the, the view also, uh, especially to Prof. Alindio. Uh, once again, thank you, Professor Ikeda. Thank you to all participants and Dr. Carmelo. Thank you very I'd much. Like to thank, thank you, Chandra and <clears throat> Carmelo and, and the CME um, and Provolindo for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Yes, you're welcome, Professor Ikeda. Thank you. Thank you.